Hey everybody, welcome to The Secret History of Living in Your Aquarium, the channel where we take evidence and experience, put them together, and tell you everything you could possibly want to know about a subject. Today I'm going to tell you about an incredibly underrated and often overlooked live fish food, one that is a really cool creature in its own right and that many people decide to keep as an aquatic pet after keeping it as a live culture to feed to their fish or their turtles or reptiles. And that is the Gamerous Shrimp or Gamerous Shrimp Side Swimmer, Water Flea. Uh, people call them different things, but they are an amphipod. And the species we are looking at today is known as the Hyalela Azteca. And in the ornamental fish hobby, it's very common. However, they are mostly known and referred to much more simply than all of that, as scuds. We're going to be talking about scuds. Uh, a nearly free fish food and tank cleaner and algae eater. Today we will be covering most anything you could want to know about scuds. So starting with what they are, where they live, and what makes them such a great renewable resource of high quality fish food as well as a useful member of your aquarium's ecosystem and cleanup crew also. So first we'll be discussing where you can source them and how keeping them in a community tank, a planted tank like this one here, can be a great way to reduce the waste and yet simultaneously create a cohesive ecosystem and food web in the planted aquarium by converting that waste into energy that your fish eat. And then when that becomes waste, it gets processed, processed by the scuds again, so on and so forth. And so it gets utilized to the max. Next, we will cover some tips and tricks gathered by both personal experience from myself and with wisdom from several fish keepers I consulted while researching this video. And they are fish keepers with over 50 years of experience each. And I've condensed everything that they've told me and I've combined it with what I know, what I research, and I've put it together in a simple and easy guide so that I think I have prepared here what is the easiest way to learn how to culture, keep, and harvest these things if you want to use them as a live food culture. So if you decide to avoid having them uh, colonize your, your community tanks and you want to keep them on their own, that's great. Or if you want a low maintenance, uh, high energy uh, food source, uh, we can keep them in any container that's two gallons or more, all the way up to like an IBC tote or a large fish tank. And then you can raise them away from shrimp or snails where they may be considered a pest. And you can keep them in your fish room still. So uh, you can either have them in you know, an opaque container where you don't have to look at them like a, a small bucket even, uh, or you can have them in a tank where uh, you can enjoy them as a standalone creature uh, of their own. But lastly, we will end the video with a few words uh, of advice on raising them and some tips and tricks on how to best utilize them. So that's the rundown of today's video. It's going to be a deep dive, my friends, so I hope you're ready. Let's get ready and welcome to the comprehensive guide to scuds. Yeah, didn't think I'd be uh, saying that ever, but here we are. So now let me say first off that scuds are a small creature uh, that can simply be released into your planted tank and they can help create a balanced ecosystem. They become a little food, a little critter that's running around your tank and your fish will eat them and as long as you have fish in there and it's not a shrimp or snail only tank they'll never become too populated so they just kind of lay low and come out at night and really that's the most you'll see of them other than one or two here or there so as in the case of most people watching this video though i'm assuming you want to keep them separately as a live food culture because there's not much i need to tell you about tossing them in your tank but pound for pound, they are just about as nutritious as brine shrimp and daphnia. And they are best utilized to feed fish that are like nano fish adults 
or mid-size fry up to all the way up to medium fish because they're a lot bigger than baby brine shrimp or baby daphnia. But they're about the same size as an adult daphnia uh, on the small end and then they get larger than that as well. So they can be utilized to feed different fish with the same nutrient profile. So they are extremely high in protein and vital nutrients, including omega-3 and 6 fatty acids, uh, carbohydrates, and carotenoids, which are both an immune system booster in fish. And of course, uh, if you've watched my channel, you've heard this a million times, but they boost the color. They enhance the color of your fish. So they are not only a food source, these scuds, but they also convert organic matter and literal fish poo waste into energy that will be utilized again and again by your plants and when they get eaten by your fish. Scuds almost magically tend to target rotting plant material and algae before resorting to eating live plants, which is nice, but they will eat live plants from time to time. They prefer hair algae, blackbeard algae, cyanobacteria, mold, uh, fungi, you name it, anything rotten pretty much, and they are an ideal source of food for fish because they convert the energy and nutrients that is there that's hard to gather uh, in other creatures, and they put it into a nice little packet. So what are scuds, scientifically speaking? Well, scuds are a genus of quarter-inch to inch-long, tiny armored amphipods, and they are basically like tiny little shrimp. And they belong to a genus of invertebrates with over 1,500 described species uh, in freshwater alone, with more than 9,000 cousins around the globe. Seemingly, the only thing that limits where they are is the amount of oxygen in the environment they're living in. They exist at 17,000 feet deep down in the ocean and up to 15,000 feet up at Lake Titicaca and in the Himalayan plateaus and lakes. Uh, with many more yet to be discovered, who knows how extreme they are. Uh, can tolerate and where they may be found next in caves underground and things they're constantly being found. So what this means is basically there is a species for just about every condition you could want or imagine from the Arctic to the tropics and everywhere in between. And uh, we've got some perfect ones for tropic and subtropical freshwater fish that can tolerate just about any parameters you throw at them. All right, so where should you keep your scuds and what species of scud should you keep? Because scuds exist just about everywhere. So basically, there's going to be a species that we can pick for our tanks that's just about perfect. And kind of unfortunately, they've picked us. And that is the species that has decided to colonize a lot of aquaculture in the fish hobby and those specific species do well in a huge range of aquarium parameters they just need a little bit of hardness in the water and we'll get to that when we talk about uh, the setup but they've actually been problematic they're so at home in our tanks and so they are considered a pest in invertebrate only tanks or plant only tanks now they would rather eat algae, cyanobacteria, uh, mold, fungi, uh, dead fish, food, whatever it is that's in the tank, they'd rather eat that pretty much ahead of fresh plants because they don't want to digest the cell walls. They want to get the most bang for their buck out of the energy that they're eating. And so they want the nutrients that's in it, but they don't want to digest the cell walls, which are tough in, in a plant. So basically, they're using the trick of using bacteria and other organisms that are smaller than them, even in your aquariums, that have already started to break down the cell walls, meaning that they are detrivores. So these little critters survive off of dead and rotting stuff. Other than that, they can survive in a lot of different parameters, and they just need a GH and KH of around three or more, uh, meaning they need a little bit of calcium, a little bit of carbon for their exoskeletons, and other than that, they're at home in alkaline, acidic, hot, cold, you name it. 
they do reproduce a bit faster in cooler waters in the 60 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit range just because oxygen is a limiting factor for the species. Uh, but I've found from day to day that I can actually keep them in my tanks, uh, be it these uh, lush community tanks, as long as I have enough plants for them to hide down in and a substrate that's uh, got some space in between it. So fluval stratum, Amazonia, um, gravel, even coarse sand that the babies can hide in, they'll survive in there and they'll come out at night being nocturnal. They'll reproduce every now and then. They'll have their uh, 10 to 50 babies and then their babies will go back down to the substrate, hide in the plants and things and then come out as a snack for fish every here and then. But we'll get into the life cycle a bit more in just a moment um, because uh, some people don't want to put them in their tanks because, say, they have no algae to eat, no extra fish flakes being fed for them to eat. Uh, there's, there's nothing that they would want to eat in your tank. They've already cleaned everything up and their population uh, is still growing. Well, that's when they could start eating your plants, especially if there's no fish, obviously, then there's nothing to control their population other than their one-year age limit. Also, they will eat baby shrimp, and they will eat baby fish and fish eggs from time to time. They'll even eat snails from time to time. So if they get really desperate, they are a really resourceful and interesting little creature, uh, but most of the time, that's not going to be the case. Most of the time, you'd barely see them if you just toss them in. But because of all this, we're going to talk about keeping them separately in a separate tank. So the species that are ideal for that and that can survive living then in your fish tank are Gomerus fasciatus and Echnogomerus ischnus. Now, because we don't know for sure without DNA testing, because they're such little uh, critters, uh, we don't know which is which. But if you uh, find these for sale online, have no fear. Uh, you're going to get one of those two. They are completely common in the hobby. Uh, and uh, I know uh, a couple places you can get them right now as I speak, uh, including aquatic arts. So if you look for them online, uh, you can find them. Just look up. G-A-M-M-A-R-U-S, Gamaris, and you'll find them. Uh, the other name for them, obviously, is Scuds, uh, but their scientific genus is Gamaris, or uh, also Pseudogamaris, and uh, a few other, like Echnogamaris, are going to be very, very similar. Um, and if you go out collecting, however, there's such a wide range of them out there, like I mentioned, that you don't know for sure what you're getting and what its tolerance is going to are going to be or if it carries parasites because we'll talk about how they reproduce a little later and unfortunately the fact that they re reproduce that way the fact that they have gills just like a little shrimp um, all of these things mean that they actually are big enough to host parasites that are able to transfer to your fish as well uh, so you want to be careful uh, if you're collecting them in the wild, whereas if they're if you're getting them from a source, uh, you know that you trust, they should be free of that. It's really uh, the wild ones that usually have the parasites, the worms, the nematodes, things like that, uh, that you need to clear up with medication. And uh, the problem is that dosing that medication is hard because it'll kill ninety percent of your scuds, and you'll have to kind of restart your colony. So. Do, that, do, some, do yourself a favor and just go to a place that sells them. Uh, and for me, I go to Aquatic Arts. Uh, if you watch the channel, you know that I support them. And uh, I like what they do there, their ethics and everything. And I've got a code in the description uh, down below. Uh, starting February now of 2023, the code will be FISHTORY, uh, F-I-S-H-T-O-R-Y. FISHTERY15, no spaces, all caps, uh, and that will get you 15% off. If you use that code more than once in four months, then it will be FISHTERY10, and you can still get 10% off. On top of that, we do givings and uh, we do givings, we do uh, giveaways and drawings for prizes from time to time. 
from people who buy, but also just for everyone on the channel because they like to uh, be charitable over there at Aquatic Arts. And I appreciate that so much. So if you want to return the favor, if you're looking for scuds, you can get a colony of 50 of them clean and uh, ready to go to start your colony uh, over at aquaticarts.com and uh, also help out the channel. Uh, so I'd appreciate that if you want to do that. Okay, so now that you've got your, your uh, scuds, do you want to keep them in a community tank or do you want to keep them on their own as a live food culture? Well, what do we need to do to get them to colonize a live culture tank in order to keep the little meals on wheels or, well, meals on fins? Uh, keep them healthy and, and ready to eat by your fish. So not much. They, they'll they live in a 2.5 gallon tank. I wouldn't put them in anything much smaller uh, or a bucket. Uh, and you can keep them in anything bigger than that, all the way up to IBC totes or whatever you want. But remember, the bigger the tank, the bigger the output of the scuds. And in the wild, scuds can colonize at a rate of 10,000 per square meter uh, of water. So, or, or rather cubic meter of water, sorry, square meter of water wouldn't make sense. They are 3D creatures, I promise. So <laughs> yeah, one, one, uh, one cubic meter, 10,000 of them can live. And in captivity, we can get that number even higher uh, with good aeration and basically nutrition being uh, much, much higher than it would be in the wild. So all you want to do to get the tank ready is put in a substrate and get the KH and GH levels to register on the charts. If you have soft water, this will be an issue for you. So you'll need a substrate that buffers. So something like Fluval uh, stratum or uh, something like Amazonia soil, that stuff all works fine. You can also just use gravel. Uh, we'll talk about the method for a glass bottom tank if you don't want to go to all the trouble of having a tank and uh, having an entire uh, substrate plant and you know ecosystem thing going on. But either way, you're going to want to add some crushed coral or boiled eggshells if you're on a budget. You can boil the eggshells, crush them up, and just mix them in with the substrate. About a uh, half a teaspoon to a teaspoon of either one of those <clears throat> per uh per uh, about per two gallons. So if you have a two and a half gallon tank, a teaspoon is probably plenty of eggshells or um, cuddle bone or whatever source of calcium you want to use for them to build their tiny little armored exoskeletons. Uh, beyond this, they're going to need that substrate to hide in. So how do you get scuds to reproduce? That's the next question. Well, how do you get them to stop? That's the question I really wanted to know, and I could find no answer. So in a fish tank with fish and plenty of vegetation like this, if you just toss them in your community tank, they're going to hide. They're going to have some young. Some will survive. Your fish will eat them whenever they're out in the day, and uh, you probably won't see many, uh, even if your fish are getting a good supplemental food. In 2007, a study actually revealed that one female freshwater scud uh, of the kind we're talking about reproduced and had 24,221 offspring if you count the babies she had, the babies they had, the babies they had, so on and so forth in the course of a year, considering they can have up to 50 uh, young at a time and they only take about a month to mature and then four months to reach their maximum size when they can have 50 babies themselves. But let's talk about their reproduction for a moment. So from time to time, you'll notice that your scuds, as long as you don't have fish in the tank, they'll be swimming around doing their thing, and there'll be two of them linked together, kind of like uh, this. And that's called piggybacking by scientists. And what it is, is it's the males showing the females, I am the toughest, I am the most genetically fit male around here, and you should reproduce with me. And so up for up to three or four days, males may carry the female around like that, 
then they'll both uh, usually shed and then they'll reproduce. The male will pass the female uh, some fertility uh, material and she will put that on her eggs that are ready and then she'll uh, let go of her eggs from internally and keep them on her belly where they'll pass into a uh, into an anatomical feature called a marsupium, which I think is the most adorable name. Uh, marsupials, marsupium, kangaroos, pout. No? Okay. Well, and anyways, in her marsupium, that's where the babies will grow, very similar to shrimp, where she'll use her swimmerettes to actually manipulate the eggs and make sure they don't uh, rot or anything like that. Um, and also get oxygen to them. In anywhere from two weeks to three weeks, they will then hatch and then she'll hold them for an extra four days to eight days on her belly as hatched babies. And then uh, she'll, she'll make sure that they've shed once and then she'll release them from her little uh, pouch container on her belly uh, where they'll make their way down into the substrate. Now, at this point, they're about half a millimeter to a millimeter long. So they're very tiny, uh, but they are pretty rich in nutrients already because they've got that basically like yolk sac that they're born with, the energy they're born with from the egg. So the babies grow really, really fast. And within a month, they can make babies of their own, like I said. So when they're little babies, they hide down in the substrate and they will come out from time to time to eat, but they'll probably look for mulm and things that have fallen down in the substrate, and they don't need a whole lot of calories to survive. So they're a very effective uh, recycler. In fact, they'll eat plants, obviously, from an aquascape that are nice and fine, but they'd much rather eat, like I said, the algae, the fungi, and the, the broken down material, extra fish food, stuff that's not living tissue uh, they'd rather eat if they have the choice now if they're desperate that's when they start targeting things like shrimp even baby fry of very small species of fish things like that and that's why you probably want to keep this live culture in its own container as well as the fact that then you can just get them out and serve them to your fish tank uh, whenever you want and honestly it's going to be hard for them to establish a presence in a fish tank, if you're worried about that, if you've got adult fish, even nano fish, they're going to get eaten pretty quickly. Uh, unless you're putting like 50 to 100 in there, you're probably not going to have a survival rate. Now, you can also choose to spot feed them using a pipette or a turkey baster like I do. Uh, some people will just pour a cup of them in or use a, a net to, to strain them. And we'll talk about the best way to do that in a moment. But I like to spot feed so that I can also keep track of feeding like five or six at a time, make sure they get eaten, and they're not escaping and establishing in any tank I don't want them to be. Now, if they're already in that tank, then I'm like, all right, have at it. You know, go establish wherever. You're going to get eaten anyways. Because I know there definitely aren't 24,000 uh, babies showing up in these tanks. That's for sure. But the cool thing, if you decide to keep them in a tank of their own, is that you can also decide to build them a nursery. And if you don't want to have substrate on the bottom of the tank, you can build what's called a nursery, and you can use a small Tupperware container or a bowl, and you can buy anything, whether it's you know, Brightwell soil, uh, Fluval stratum, uh, even you could cut up sponges, you could use filter media, anything, uh, pumice, lava rock, anything that has little holes and nooks and crannies for the baby scuds to hide in and live in, that works. And then they'll come out at night being nocturnal, they'll feed, and then they'll go back and hide. Um, so that works out pretty well with mulm and other things eventually kind of falling into that nursery. Then you can actually just grab that nursery uh, put your net over it, a very fine net, like a brine shrimp net, and you can move the whole thing out to the top of the water, flip it over, and yeah, you'll have to pick the, the substrate stuff out again. Uh, but basically, the babies will go flying everywhere up into your net, and then you can just kind of scoop them up with a secondary net, 
or you can just grab the materials out of there and you've got all these babies. But when you do that, you're definitely wiping out an entire generation. So be aware uh, that harvesting them that way is going to get rid of all of them. But it is a great way to feed hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of them, to uh, a large size group of fish or a big batch of uh, fish fry if you're really trying to fatten them up for something. Uh, and you want those little tiny ones. Now, if you want the adults, you can put substrate across the entire bottom and you, you'll want to put in like a sponge filter or an air stone to keep it oxygenated ideally. Now, that's if you want the most bang for your buck of them. I have kept them in tanks that look like this and they're basically just compost bins. They, I, I trim plants. I uh, throw any fish that pass away. Uh, if I overfeed food and I'm like, oh, shoot, and I have to scoop it out, uh, I'll throw that in there. And then basically I give them some uh, protein fortified food. So I feed them uh, aquarium co-op uh, fry food, which is basically just fish meal. Or I'll give them something like krill flakes from Brine Shrimp Direct. Uh, which is, you know, both of those are coming up on 60% protein, which is great because brine shrimp are actually uh, right around 60% protein, uh, baby brine shrimp, uh, once they're dried and uh, like mashed up and served that way, or if they're freeze dried, once the moisture is taken out of them. Uh, well, it turns out scuds, as long as they're eating a diet of nutritious things like that and they're not um, just munching on you know celery or some sort of uh, plant that doesn't have a complete nutrient profile uh, they can be fortified to have up to 60 percent protein uh, crude protein by dry weight so if you take all of the liquid out of them uh, they're 60 percent protein at 10 to 15 percent fat and somewhere around 25 percent carbohydrates which is really similar to Daphnia and baby brine shrimp, uh, which is uh, basically the, you know, the, the king of, of all fish foods to feed to your, your growing fish and to keep a good color enhancement on your fish because they need those carotenoids, those fats, and those minerals to look their best. And it really does make a huge difference. So what also makes a big difference is keeping plants in your, your scud tank that are breaking down. So even though it looks like a freaking wreck and over time it may even smell if it's like 85 degrees out or something, having a tank like the one I showed uh, where it looks like pea soup may actually be a, a just fine way to keep these things uh, at their highest nutritional value. Um, but if you don't wanna do that, you can just put substrate in the bottom put a filter in it. Now you're going to want to let it cycle in either case because they are also sensitive to ammonia. Just like your shrimp or your fish, they have gills. And like I've said, they need oxygen. That is their limiting factor. And if they don't have that, then uh, they can't grow as fast. And at, if they don't have enough of it at a certain point, they will die. And if they've had too much ammonia, it scars their gills, they can't breathe the oxygen, and then they die. So that's usually how they die in a tank if a whole colony fails. So just make sure that it's uh, well, uh, well filtered and that you understand the nitrogen cycle and that the uh, sponge filter or even just the bottom of the tank, if you're going filterless, and the plants that are in the tank have enough surface area that they're hosting enough of the nitrobacillus, nitrobacter, nitrosomas that uh, allow your tank to be cycled. All right, so if you want to feed the adults, all you have to do is just throw in some fish food every now and then. You can even throw fish flakes. I'll put my excess mulm, my plant trimmings, all of that into the scud tank, and then I will just let them be. And whenever I feel like it, I'll go over to the tank and I'll decide, all right, I'm going to harvest some. And I'll get a piece of, uh, say, broiled squash or boiled zucchini or pumpkin or banana or banana peel even. And I'll put it on one of those Pleco corkscrews, 
uh, that you've seen probably, uh, or weigh it down and they'll start eating all over it. I'll turn the lights out too, because they're nocturnal and, uh, they're frightened a little bit by light, but then I'll, uh, come in with a fine mesh net and I'll just put the food in it, in the tank and pull them out. All I have to do then is shake off the food and I've got a net full of food to feed my fish, all the adult scuds and baby scuds right there. Now, you could also sort them with screens. That's pretty easy too. You can buy different size screens and then literally shake them through different size uh, brine shrimp screens or, uh, yeah, they're usually brine shrimp screens is what they'd be called. Uh, they look like this. Yeah, you can get them from uh, Brine Shrimp Direct and uh, other places as well. I don't have any discount codes for Brine Shrimp Direct, unfortunately, guys. Sorry. But in any case, that's one of my favorite things to do. Then you can wash them off if you want. I like to rinse them off just uh, because that tank water is kind of green water, and I don't want to be putting more algae or, or broken down stuff into, their, uh, into the tank that has fish uh, from the scud tank. And so either way, whether you have it glass bottom and you just have the nursery and a sponge filter as your surface area and an air stone running, or you have a mucky swamp compost bin of a tank like I have, um, it works out just fine. And you can get them out that way, those two ways that I just described. And then you can use a pipette or a turkey baster to spot feed and actually a lot of loaches and uh, things even like puffers they've evolved to have hard things with shells or exoskeletons in their diet so they need roughage just like humans need uh they need <laughs> metamucil just like grandpa needs metamucil no just like humans need fiber uh to stay regular um they need that that in their diet in certain fish a lot of times predatory fish or catfish and bottom feeder fish but if you don't want to have uh that exoskeleton there is a little trick you can use and one is uh, allowing them to stay in water overnight that is chlorinated that will dissolve their shell oftentimes it can also kill them but a lot of times they're hardy enough to withstand it it's going to vary depending on how chlorinated your water is uh, where you live. But there's another nice and more humane trick, even though they're going to go get fed most likely. So maybe humane is not the right word. But there's another trick uh, that will keep them alive for your fish so that the fish have that reaction to the live motion uh, that you're looking for uh, by feeding them. And that is you can just do a water change of softer water. So how I was talking about adding crushed coral or eggshells like a teaspoon every two gallons or so, well, that's going to make your TDS, your total dissolved solids, your KH and GH a little bit higher. Plus things like fluval stratum, uh, things like ADA Amazonas or Brightwell substrate have a buffer built in. So if you put that in your nursery container, then that's going to work just fine even uh, on its own for your nursery container. And you can, uh, you can use that to buffer your water and to uh, make your water hard enough that when you do a water change every few weeks, so uh, kind of rarely, uh, you can, I tend to just top off the tanks, but if you do a water change with somewhere between 10 and 30% softer water, within 24 hours, those little uh, scuds tend to lose their exoskeleton. Something about the new fresh water keeps them uh, molting it makes them molt faster and when they molted they're this soft little thing however they will be a little more shy about eating if they've just molted so it's a little bit of a trade-off but <clears throat> it works uh pretty well if you can make a difference between their tank water being a bit hard and the water change water softening that the only thing is you can't do that day after day after day so that's really if you want to feed a whole bunch of tanks in one day and you want to use a trick other than the one with just putting the food in the net and grabbing them at feeding time each day, however many you need. Um, that's the other way you can feed a whole bunch of soft, uh, de-shelled ones essentially to them. Or you can just feed the babies. They don't have uh, hardly any shells either. So a few last tips about these shrimp or 
seed shrimp or scuds as they should be called. Seed shrimp are actually ostracods and they're something different and I've done a whole video on it. So if you're curious about them, uh, go ahead and look at that video, but I just wanted to mention that quickly. All right, my friends. Well, that is uh, actually just about it. That concludes SCUDS 101. 101. There we go. Uh, I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. Uh, I have a whole bunch of older content about live food cultures, species spotlights and profiles, and deep dives on all sorts of different topics. So as always, first I want to thank my uh, channel members. It's only a buck ninety nine. You get access to my podcast way ahead of the public. Now that we have a podcast, that's sixteen episodes a month, most months, and uh, you make things happen. You allow me to make these videos. But also, thank you so much to everyone who just made it to the end of this video. You guys rock too, and I can't forget you. All my replay crew and. Uh, all my uh, lurkers and live watchers and video watchers, I love you all the same. Uh, so thanks, everybody. I'd love to hear any uh, thoughts, comments, or tips and tricks you have with live uh, fish foods, especially of the larger variety, like scud size, rather than the teeny tiny stuff. Uh, leave it in the comments below. I'd love to hear about it. All right, guys. I will see you next time on The Secret History, living in your aquarium.